And it's a great honor to be with you. I'm so grateful. I want to say hi to everybody at all of the campuses, everybody who's watching online, everybody who's here in the room. It's been a wonderful weekend. I got to be with lots of folks on the staff and bridge group leaders and, and volunteers at this church yesterday. We had a great time. And um, uh, it's very meaningful to me to be able to be here with you. So thank you for letting me be here. Uh, an author, Lisa Turkist, notes that very often we have a sense of what we ought to do or the person that we want to become or the life that we'd like to live, but we get stopped by a single two-word phrase, but I, but I, but I. I don't think I can do it. I don't think it's in me. I ought to work out and get in shape. I know I should, but I'm tired. It would be great to get into a bridge group and form deep, meaningful, authentic relationships, but I'm kind of introverted. I would love to live relaxed and confident, but I tend to worry too much. I know I ought to eat kale and quinoa and tofu, but I love sugar and butter and bacon and barbecue. Uh, sometimes those two words get me out of something that uh, I really don't want to do. Honey, would you change the light bulb? But I'm just not very mechanical. But I is what we might call a defeater belief. It stops me not just from succeeding at uh, what really matters, it stops me from even trying. I'll never even know, because I just excuse myself, but I can't do it. And then to make things worse, sometimes I find out I'm not even competent in areas where I didn't know I wasn't competent. When I moved to San Francisco, uh, there was a guy named Ned Coletti with the San Francisco Giants baseball team, and uh, he was involved at the church where I was, so he asked one time if I would speak at a chapel for the team, and I said, sure. And then he said, would you like to take batting practice at the Giants ballpark? I thought, well, that would be fabulous. So he asked John Yandel, John Yandel used to throw batting practice for Barry Bonds, if he would throw me some pitches. John was a couple years older than me, so this was not like facing real big league pitching. I had played Sandlot baseball in the neighborhood when I was growing up, and so I thought I could do this. I get to stand in this batter's box at AT&T Park. It was so cool. And John wound up and let go, and I heard the sound of the ball hitting the net behind me. And I thought, he's not just lobbing them in there like I was expecting. He wanted to make this a contest. He's throwing the ball as hard as he can. He wants to see if I can hit his best stuff. So he wound up again, and this time I swung. But by the time my bat reached the plate, the ball was already in the net. And so uh, I kept uh, starting my swing earlier every time. Eventually, I would start my swing about the same time he went into his windup. And I had several foul balls, so I was feeling pretty good. And then he said, would you like me to put a little zip on one? <laughs> In other words, those has been his lobs. So I said, well, sure, it's been kind of hard for me to time these slow pitches. And he wound up one more time, and I never even saw the ball. And so I asked him, like, was that your best pitch? He said, no, you wouldn't even want to see my best pitch. Good t-ball player could crunch it, though. And he sent a scouting report to Ned Coletti. John Ortberg bats right, throws right, took 10 minutes of batting practice. As a hitter, John makes a good pitcher, pastor. <laughs> but I sucketh at baseball and did not even know. That little phrase, but I, very human, we all live with that, actually comes up in the Bible over and over again, uh, usually as kind of an excuse when God calls somebody to do something. God says to Moses, I want you to go and confront Pharaoh. Moses says, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. God comes to Gideon and says, Gideon, I want you to deliver my people from the Midianites. And Gideon immediately says, but I am the least of my family. God comes to Jeremiah and wants him to bring his word to his people. Jeremiah, be a prophet for me. But I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. God wants Esther to go and deliver the people from this homicidal maniac. But I have not been called by the king for 30 days. God wants Abraham to become the father of a great people. But I'm too old. Jesus wants Peter to cast his nets on the other side of the boat. But I tried all night. Over and over and over again, we see these words in the Bible, and we see them in our own lives. I woke up this morning, um, looked in the mirror. I don't know if you can tell on the video screen. Uh, I have real fair skin, and I'm in this run where I have to put this special kind of cream on it, and it brings all the flaws up in the surface, and my face kind of looks like a pizza at the moment. And I thought, but I don't want anybody to look at my face today. I don't want to. I can't. I can't 
confront, I can't speak, I can't prophesy, I can't lead, can't have a child, can't heal, can't obey, can't overcome. And sometimes this goes real deep. Maybe it does for you today. I can't save my marriage. I can't put my family back together. I can't seem to control this habit. I can't seem to stop this addiction. I can't stop worrying. I can't come out of this depression. Now, what's interesting when we see this statement in the Bible is God never disagrees with these statements. He doesn't say, hey, Moses, actually, you're a pretty good speaker. Or really, Abraham, you're not all that old. You're in pretty good shape. Humanly, we often respond that way. We often collude with each other in what might be called the denial of our inadequacy. No, no, no. You're amazing. This was actually a bit of a technique in the ancient world. We're going to look at a bit of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And Corinth in the ancient world was a very competitive culture. It was a Roman colony. It was the center for a lot of trade and commerce because it was on that trade route. Economically, a lot going on there. So there was lots of pressure. They had a saying, in Corinth, only the tough survive. And so in this great city, there's this little band of ragtag followers of Jesus. A lot of them were slaves. Most of them would have ranked pretty low on the adequacy scale. And there was actually ancient advice that said to speakers or to writers who were trying to gain credibility with their audience, one great way to do it is be sure to throw in some praise for them. Tell them how intelligent they are. Remind them they are influential or powerful, or well-educated, or well-born. Okay, that's what communicators are supposed to do to gain entree. With that as a backdrop, imagine how the Corinthians felt in that little church when they read Paul's description of them at the beginning of his letter. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Thanks a lot, Paul. He doesn't start out, hey, Corinth, you got IQ, you got EQ, you got connections, you got resources. How lucky God was to have you sign up. You're killing it, Corinth. He actually invites them to reflect on what we might call the review of personal inadequacy, even the celebration of personal inadequacy. Hey, Church at Corinth, how should we describe you? Wise? Nope. Influential? Nope. Great gene pool? Nope. But he's remarkably untroubled by this. The, the implication is quite strange to us. He doesn't go on to say, therefore, church, lower your expectations. Don't get your hopes up because you don't have much. He doesn't say, thank God a few of you are rich and smart. You're the ones God's counting on. You'll get stuff done. No, he says to expect great things, not because they have great things to offer to God, but because God is up to something in this world that nobody in this world could have expected. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. But God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. But God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. But God chose, but God chose, but God chose. Now in the Bible, those two little words, but God, are of huge significance because they mean that there is a system in our world. There's a way that things run apart from God. And it's the rich and the smart and the strong that tend to do well. And injustice and oppression and problem and sin and getting trapped in our inadequacy overcomes all of us. There's kind of a trajectory, but now it has been interrupted. Now, something has come to turn the tide. Now, especially through Jesus, 
God's presence and God's power, God's kingdom has become available for ordinary people to live in. These are the two words that over and over, when you see them in the Bible, you want to note them because the big shift is coming, a great reversal. They're the two words that are the turning point of this whole passage and can be the turning point of any human life, whatever you're facing today, but God. But God is now doing in Corinth what he's already done on the cross with Jesus, overturning expectations, elevating the lowly, changing death into life, taking what the world regards as abject failure, humiliation, the end of the ministry of that rabbi, and turning it into glorious victory and resurrection. So if you carry nothing else away from this message, I want us all to carry away those two words, but God. So let's say them together out loud. But God. Let's try it once more with great passion and conviction and energy and joy. But God. But God means this world does not get the last word on who you can be or what you can do or how you will live. I can't, but God can. The world may say your situation will never change. The world may say, your lack of education will always embarrass you, that addiction will always enslave you, that depression will always defeat you, that failure will always haunt you, that future will always frighten you, that weakness will always stop you, but God, thank God, says otherwise, but God begs to differ. And just like the phrase, but I, is in the Bible over and over and over again, that little phrase, but God, gets used dozens of times in the Bible. Joseph says to his brothers who sold him into slavery, you intended it to harm. That's the trajectory that my life was going on, but God intended it for good. The psalmist says, my flesh and my heart may fail. That is true. I am one of the inadequate ones, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Jesus said, with human beings, it is impossible. Salvation, goodness, ultimate justice, pipe dream with human power alone. But with God, all things are possible. So stop excusing yourself from God's calling on your life by whining about your inadequacy. But I, but I, but I, but I. I know this sounds odd, but I just don't know how else to say it. God is bigger than your butt. <laughs> One T. Of course you're not smart enough. Of course you're not strong enough. Of course we are not good enough. But God has chosen the foolish and the weak and the lowly and the meek and the timid and the poor and the too loud and the not very polished and the troubled and the addicted and the failed and whatever else is going on in your heart or your job or your family or with your money or with your children or with your health and it looks really bad and I know but God I tell you that sin death pain and hell are real but they are not final because the power of the cross has not yet finished remaking this sorry world you think our society is tough and it is but we got nothing on coin they lived in a world where the scramble for honor and rank and status was the predominant human activity. That was, that was the number one occupation for human beings. Not just people at the top of the ladder. Cicero used to say that life is about honor. Rank must be preserved. That's what life was about in Corinth. All the way down in Corinth, even slaves would rank themselves compared to other slaves in the household to try to look like somebody compared to them. But God says otherwise. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. That does not mean there will not be pain in the future. There will. It means, yes, pain comes, but God will have the eternal last word. Morning may last through the night, but with God, joy comes in the morning. Now, you might think, well, Church of Corinth had a lot of problems, had a lot of inadequate, weak people, but surely Paul had a lot of confidence in his own competence, in his own abilities, because he was a brilliant man, a brilliant mind, unbelievable gifts. And here's where his words get even stranger. Um, there were 
If you've ever read his letters, there's two of them in the New Testament to the church at Corinth, and he writes about this a fair bit. There were other wannabe leaders for the church there, kind of self-proclaimed apostles. He actually calls them sometimes super apostles because their credentials were quite remarkable. They were trying to lure that, that little church at Corinth away from Paul and Jesus and this message that is oddly centered in a cross where what looks like defeat and loss and weakness becomes resurrection and strength and surrender becomes victory. And, and they were trying to send a message that kind of operates that our world generally does. It's all going to go to the strong and the powerful. They compared their ministry to Paul's and they said they had greater visions. They said they could do greater miracles. They attracted financial backers. Back in that day, there were folks that would travel around speaking, kind of like Paul did. Often they were called sophists, uh, sophistry, wisdom. They were kind of like motivational speakers in our day or life coaches, and they would be able to attract lots of money if they were really good. They were rock stars. They get tons of people to come out and listen to them and support them. And people thought that's what Paul was. So they expected Paul to act like those guys did. Paul is writing to win them back to Jesus and to Paul's message. So everybody would expect Paul to list his ministry credentials and his achievements, because he had a lot of them, to write to them about, here's how many souls I've saved and churches I've planted and sermons I've preached and letters I've written that, by the way, will end up in the New Testament as Scripture. And he doesn't do any of that. How does he talk about himself? This is so weird. He says, I have been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. He lists his failures, problems, rejections, and anxieties. It is a celebration of personal inadequacy. Who does that? And the climax is in this. In order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Other words, apparently Paul has a problem being conceited. Paul has got ego issues that, that threaten to destroy his character. And he tells everybody about this quite openly. His ego is so bad that he was given at some level, in some way by God, some painful and shameful condition that also involves quite dark suffering, a messenger from Satan. He calls it a thorn in the flesh. And, and for many centuries, there have been all kinds of guesses trying to figure out what was Paul's thorn in the flesh. Maybe it was a vision problem. He talks in one of his letters about how somebody else was writing it for him. Maybe he couldn't see well enough to write. Maybe it was epilepsy. Visions and trances are about that. Maybe some version of PTSD. Maybe Paul suffered from anxiety. He writes about nobody else can suffer without my being anxious. People would say that his letters were real impressive, but when he came to speak, and those were the rock stars, not, not much, not very impressive. Maybe he had some kind of speech defect. Maybe he's got a weight problem, and that's real visible. Whatever it is, it's a source of ridicule and humiliation for him. And if that's not bad enough, he went to God and asked God, would you take this thorn away? And his prayers for thorn removal are a failure. He is a failure at prayer multiple times. These other super apostles are strong, successful, charismatic, eloquent, wealthy poster boys for a God living their best lives right now. Paul is a train wreck, a beaten, whipped, tent-making, conceit-prone, thorn-carrying, prayer-failing, self-confessed weakling. And you're going to lead with that? Those are your credentials? Seriously, Paul? You understand how bizarre this would be? Why would anybody talk that way? One reason, two words. But God. I asked him multiple times, God, take this thorn away. But God. But I'm living with this pain, but I suffer, but I fail over and over, but I tend to be egotistical, um, but I can't stand carrying this around, but I ask God to take it away and he doesn't. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes on with this strange cross-shaped 
cruciform life and message. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. I will boast. Uh, who did that? So that Christ's power may rest on me. Because the best of human power ain't much. But the least of Christ's power, oh my goodness. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight. Now you have to ask yourself the question, is he crazy? Is he just making this stuff up to say something that will sound weird? Could a human being live this way? Could I? Could you? That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults. You ever delighted in an insult? I delight in hardships. I delight in persecutions. I delight in difficulties. Not because weakness or insults or hardships or difficulties are good. Of course they're not. They're awful. Because when I'm weak, I'm strong. I've entered into another reality, another sphere of life where now God is doing in me, through me, what I could never do. Everybody has a calling. Everybody has a thorn. You have a calling. You have a thorn. And the question is whether we will say, but I, or but God. And the answer you choose will determine the life that you lead. At the very first church that I ever worked at, First Baptist Church at Locker Center, when I was going through Fuller Seminary, I, I got up to preach and uh, about five or 10 minutes into the sermon, it felt like it wasn't going really well. And then I started to feel a little bit woozy. And then the next thing I knew, I had fainted dead away, right in the middle of a sermon. And there was a lot going on. I was going through finals in grad school. I was about to get married. My wife and I left to spend a year overseas studying. And so I thought, well, it just must have been all of that. We came back. I continued to go to Fuller, continued to work at the church. The very next time I got up to preach, one year later, I fainted dead away again. And the worst part of it was this was a Baptist church, not a charismatic church where you get credit for doing that kind of thing. And my boss, John F. Anderson, said to me, you're going to get up and preach again next week. And I said, but I don't want to. But I might faint again. Fainting when you preach is a bad quality in a preacher. It makes people kind of nervous when, when that's going on. That passage about the thorn in the flesh, God take it away, I'll live that. That was my passage. I asked God to take away that thorn of my fear and my anxiety, and he didn't. John, you're going to get up and preach, but I'm afraid, but I feel weak, but I think it's going to happen again. And God did not take my weakness away. God did not take the fear away. God did not give me any guarantee that it wouldn't happen again. For some time after that, no kidding, I would preach and I had a chair sitting right next to me so that if I started to get that feeling again, I could just sit down. For, for a period of months after that, people paid more attention to me than I have ever had happen ever since then. <laughs> God didn't take away the fear, didn't take away this, didn't take away the guarantee. But God, as of this week, has kept me upright while preaching for 39 years in a row. Some people, some people are naturally confident when it comes to dating and asking people out and taking romantic risks. I was not. I was in my mid-20s. I'd had lots of first dates, a few second dates, a couple of third dates, but never really a girlfriend. And then I met this woman, Nancy, on a blind date. And didn't seem real suave to ask for her number. The couple that introduced us lived a long ways away. So afterwards, I wanted to call her and ask her out again. I didn't know how to get her number. The only thing I knew about her was she attended this church in Whittier, Whittier Area Baptist Fellowship. 
And so I called up the church and said, I need the phone number of one of your attenders. Her name is Nancy Berg. My name is John Ortberg. I'm a pastor in La Crescenta. It's kind of a ministry thing. I need her phone number, so could you give it to me? And the receptionist put me on hold for a long time and then came back and gave me Nancy's number. What I did not know then and didn't learn for another six months was that the receptionist at that church was Nancy's mother, Verna Berg. <laughs> and she put me on hold so that she could call Nancy and say, there's some guy named John. He wants your phone number, so I give it to him. And fortunately, Nancy said yes. Now, a few months later, I heard that Nancy was dating another guy. My roommate said, you've got to call her. But I don't know what I'd say. But I don't know how she'd feel. And I called her up, and it did not go well. At one point, I said, what I'm trying to say is, I like you. Waiting for her to say, I like you too. Nothing. And I thought, this, this is not going well. Of course, I understand. The other guy is closer to her. Lives right there. He's better at this stuff than me. He's better looking than I am. All of which is true. I had no chance. But God smote that man down, romantically speaking. <laughs> and Nancy and I have now been married 38 years. I have a life partner better than I ever could have imagined. But God. Some of you have been around the recovery movement. You know about the 12 steps. And the first three of them run like this. We admitted that we were powerless over alcohol, anger, lust, fear, anxiety, money, greed, food, whatever it is. Our lives have become unmanageable. We were powerless. Our lives are unmanageable. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Made the decision to turn our lives and wills over to God as we understand him, as he has been finally fully revealed in Jesus. And that sometimes gets summarized in this way. I can't, God can, I think I'll let him. I can't, but I. God can, but God. And then here's the choice point, and here's really why I have come to Charlotte. Here's what I want to offer you, the opportunity to make a decision around I think I'll let him. I can't. God can. I think I'll let him. So I will let go of my life, my past with its regrets and sin and guilt and shame. I will receive forgiveness by grace through what Jesus did on that cross. My agenda, my need to try to be in control of what I'm not in control of, I demand to have my own way, my own little project of my life. I will let go of that. I will surrender my life and my will to God, become a follower of Jesus. Have you done that? There's a writer and a priest by the name of Henry Nouwen, who I love, touched many, many people, someone with deep wounds, and, and who knew how to meet Jesus in the pain of inadequacy. He became fascinated in the final years of his life, of all things, with a group of trapeze artists known as the Flying Rodleys. And there was something about them and their physical grace and beauty and courage and the way they would leap through the air. And Henry Nolan, this physically quite awkward little priest, uh, was kind of enamored. Uh, it, was, it was like what they did was a parable for life with God. So in the last year of his life, he literally followed them around and watched their performance and got to know them. Here's what he writes. One day I was sitting with Rodley, the leader of the troop, talking about flying, you know, jumping around on the trapeze. He said, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. The public might think that I'm the great star of the trapeze because the flyer's the one that's flying through the air. But the real star, the real star is Joe, my catcher. He has to be there for me with split-second precision and grab me out of the air as I come to him in the long jump. How does it work? Now it asked. The secret, Rodley said, is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly to Joe, 
I have simply to stretch out my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron behind the catch bar. You do nothing? Now and asked, surprised. Nothing, Rodley said. The worst thing the flyer can do is to try to catch the catcher. I'm not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's job to catch me. If I grab Joe's wrist, I might break them, or he might break mine, and that would be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly, and a catcher must catch, and the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. Flyer must fly. Catcher must catch. I can't, he can My part is to trust, to surrender, to give up my life, give up my agenda, give up my demands, give up having to have my way. God's part is to catch, and he can, and to hold, and he will. And so this invitation from Scripture Surrender your heart to God. Stretch out your hands to him. Actually, after reading that story, I went to what's called circus school in San Francisco and actually went on a trapeze and went flying to somebody. And uh, that was a scary deal. Uh, just going up on that platform is a scary deal. And it's just all about trust. And what you realize in that moment is <laughs> I, the catcher better be strong enough to catch me. Now, of course, I had a net there and, you know, carabiners and all this stuff. So I was safe, but I was still scared. Life's a scary thing. Death's a scary thing. There's a picture that I love, a wonderful picture uh, of a flyer and a catcher. And it's a really formidable flyer uh, and that just says something to me about trust and how we all depend on the catcher. I can't. God can. I think I'll let him. Now letting go is an act of the will. We all know how to grab. Little baby, put your finger out and little baby's hand will wrap around it. We're born knowing how to grab. We have to learn how to let go. That's a lifetime deal. You are going to learn over the next several weeks. This, this weekend's the beginning of a series for Forest Hill Church. What do I need to let go of in this last season that we have run through, habits that we've picked up, fears that we've experienced? What, what do I need to let go of? Because that's the problem with our wills. This is an ongoing deal. I, I turn my life and will over to God and then I take them back. I keep turning it over and taking it back. I get afraid. I get worried. I get anxious. I get upset. I get greedy. I keep turning it over. So this is the beginning of a series to learn. What do we need to let go of? Where do we need to get caught? But this day is about the most foundational letting go. I surrender my life, my need to be in control. I will obey Jesus and follow him. And this is the strange thing. When we do that, we're given a power way beyond our own ability. A lot of you will know in AA, like when you get to that third step, the third step is not, I decided I'm going to quit drinking by my willpower. In fact, in none of the steps do you decide to quit drinking. It's not a willpower deal. I surrender my life and my will to God. And then I'm given the power to do what I cannot do on my own. And it's a strange thing. We often think of dependence as a sign of weakness. We live in a culture where to be independent is taken by all kinds of experts in the social sciences as the signature of health. So we're really afraid if I depend on God, won't that make me weak or a robot? But it actually works the other way. When I depend on God, I no longer have to depend on money for my security. I no longer have to depend on success at work for my esteem. I no longer have to depend on attractiveness for my sense of worth. I no longer have to depend on your approval of me for my sense of well-being. The more dependent I am on God, the more independent I actually am in all the rest of my life because we're made to depend on God. Now, 
Of course, we're terribly fickle. I turn it over and turn it back. But God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So this is your day. This is your decision. And then I also want to say just a word to you as a church, Forest Hill Church. I love the church. I love the church. And I want to remind you together all whether you have already let go of your life to God or not, that the church is a, a precious community in this world because you steward this news that the world needs. And I know the challenge of COVID and how even in churches, there's been you know, big problems, mask fights, racial injustice, financial pressures, People identifying more with political parties than they do with Jesus. I know our world, like the world of Corinth, is full of skepticism and materialism and skepticism and individualism and political polarization. I know, I know. And I know you at Forest Hill have battled those challenges and other ones that have been real deep and, and sometimes maybe quite confusing and sometimes real personal. And, and I have two in this season in different ways. But God is not done. But God is not willing that any should perish. But God is on the move. But God chose the lowly. But God chose the weak but God chose the nobodies. And we know this because Jesus of Nazareth was put to death by nailing him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. But God, see, on a blood-stained cross at an empty tomb, but God. And death can't keep its hold on you either. So you all keep praying and serving and loving, living, suffering, comforting, dreaming. And as you do this, as you pray and serve and give, volunteer and invite and befriend, when your heart gets broken and your greatest dream dies, you ask God to redeem the suffering, bring something new and good out of it. You become part of this unseen spiritual hinge on which the doors of history turn. But God, but God, but God. So this week, Take those two words with you. But God, I can't, God can. Think I'll let him. Don't you give up. Whatever hurt or heartbreak you're facing, when you feel inadequate, when you feel unspiritual, when you feel lonely, when you feel afraid, when you're not smart enough or rich enough or strong enough, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. But God, but God, but God. Would you pray with me? Bow your heads right now. And whatever campus you're at, watching at home, here in this room. Uh, if you've never made this decision, this commitment to become a follower of Jesus, you can do that right now. You just let it go. God, now I'm letting go of my sin, past guilt, regret. Receiving your forgiveness is a free gift of grace. I'm letting go of my future, my fears and my demands and my ego. I will live as a student, as a disciple, as an apprentice of this Jesus from this day forward.
And if you've made that decision, I'd encourage you, let somebody know, tell a friend, bridge group leader, pastor. God, I pray that you would pour out great blessings on everybody listening to these words. Especially to those with a broken heart or a broken dream. We let go. We offer ourselves to you. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen.